and if the recording is successful, we do plan on posting that. We'll notify everyone if the recording is successful and where you can view the recording at once it's posted. Um, with that, I wanted to also let you know that um, as you log in, if you don't mute your phone line, I'll be uh, muting you until later in the webinar presentation when we open things up to take questions. Just want to make certain that they, we have a, a good presentation environment for our presenters. So I would like to go ahead and have the webinar presenters start now. So I'm going to turn things over. We have Jordan Whistler from the um, Central Ohio MPO Morpsey and Corey Hopwood from the ODOT Office of Safety. Gentlemen, are you there? Yeah, how's it going, Victoria? Good. So take it away. It's all yours. Okay, so actually this is Michelle May with uh, ODOT's Highway Safety Program, and I'm going to kick it off today. So uh, first of all, let me welcome everybody. I'm really excited to have everybody uh, participate, or at least a, a good number of the people that participated in our peer exchange back in October are joining us here today, so I'm excited about that. Uh, and essentially, I just want to thank all of you for joining what is our inaugural Safety Talk webinar, uh, which was really an idea born out of the peer exchange, the safety peer exchange back in October. Uh, we think it's going to be a really effective way, or we hope it's going to be an effective way, to share information and stay in touch without all of the travel. So uh, in between uh, you know, meetings, actual meetings face to face, maybe we can use this webinar, uh, basically as a forum to share new topics and best practices in traffic safety. Uh, we're going to try and uh, do so maybe once a quarter through this webinar. And the ultimate goal is to uh, help Ohio build a community of practice around this profession. Uh, so today we have two speakers uh, that are going to present. Uh, we've got Jordan Whistler of Morpsey, who's going to discuss major themes and next steps uh, from the MPO RTPO Transportation Safety Peer Exchange in October. And then Corey's going to finish out the webinar with an explanation on how uh, MPOs and RTPOs can use ODOT's new abbreviated safety application process uh, for simple safety improvements that are $500,000 or less. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan Whistler. Great. Uh, thanks, Michelle. So again, my uh, name's Jordan Whistler, and for those who don't know me, I'm a planner with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, uh, primarily engaged in our safety program and active transportation uh, planning work. And this afternoon, my goal is really to help continue the conversation uh, related to transportation safety among our regional planning organizations in the state of Ohio uh, and talk about increased efforts to better connect metropolitan and rural planning organizations with the Toward Zero Death Network. So specifically, in the next 15 minutes, uh, I'll be providing a brief summary of the MPO RTPO Transportation Safety uh, Planning Peer Exchange, uh, which occurred in Columbus in late 2016, really focusing on major themes and takeaways uh, then I'll talk about and discuss upcoming opportunities for regional planning organizations to provide increased assistance to their local partners and wrap up with next steps before handing it over to Corey to discuss the abbreviated safety study process. So to start, again, I'm going to be focusing on the MPO RTPO Transportation Safety Peer Exchange. Uh, for some background, as we know, over two-thirds of Ohio is covered by some type of regional transportation planning organization. And coincidentally, this area is where the vast majority of the state's fatalities and serious injuries occur. Uh, the area of the state covered by MPOs alone, or, or those that are blue on this map, accounted for 65% of all fatal crashes, 71% of all serious injury crashes, and 79% of all crashes reported in Ohio in 2015. When you add in the RTPOs, these numbers grow upwards of 90% which really begs the question, what impact do these regional planning organizations have on the transportation safety issues occurring with their, in their boundaries, and what role can they play in helping reduce the frequency of these severe crashes? So to help answer this question, Morpsey, ODOT, and FHWA decide to host a peer exchange dedicated to better understanding transportation safety planning at the regional level, really to provide a forum for regional agencies and their safety partners to come together to discuss their efforts and their experiences. So specifically, we went into the list looking to accomplish four key outcomes. First, we wanted to better understand current practice related to regional transportation safety planning across the state, uh, really to better understand how agencies currently consider safety within their work and the resources they have available uh, to do so. Second, we wanted to develop a baseline understanding of the transportation safety planning process among regional planning organizations across the state. 
Third, we wanted to identify shared opportunities, challenges, uh, and use this as an opportunity for our state and federal partners to recognize what those challenges are so that they could better support us in our work. And lastly, we wanted to provide an opportunity to network with peer organizations and regional partners to put faces with names, recognize who our counterparts were at peer organizations, and continue to build a community of safety practitioners with the state, ultimately better integrating regional planning organizations into the towards zero death efforts. So this event focused on four main topics that together are meant to represent a comprehensive view of transportation safety planning at the regional level and ultimately tie back to the core functions of a transportation planning organization. Transportation safety data, performance measures and targets, incorporating safety into the planning process, and project planning, evaluation, and monitoring. For each of these topics, speakers from across the state presented on both current and best practices, discussed available tools and resources, and outlined uh, uh, minimum expectations. Uh, these presentations were followed by small group breakout sessions where participants discussed content that had been presented on. Um, ultimately, these groups came back together uh, to report on what they had discussed and key themes that had emerged. So after all these presentations, discussions, uh, and themes, these were eventually synthesized into a final summary report following this event. But to that end, what were some of the major themes that emerged during this? In general, many of us identified a number of shared challenges related to fully addressing safety within our work in our regions. And chief among them were As we all know too well, there are, is only so much time in the day and there are many planning factors that we need to address as regional planning organizations and safety is just one of them. So on average, we saw that across organizations, about 20 to 30 percent of a full-time staff uh, is dedicated to safety. Additionally, many of us felt that there was a disconnect between our work identifying regionally significant safety issues and the actualization of projects to address them. Uh, that we were looking for better ways to connect the dots between issue identification and implementation of projects that address those, those same issues. Along these lines, there was also recognition that increasing the awareness and coordination between MPOs, RTPOs, and district staff is critical to advancing safety projects uh, that, that, and needs on the local system. And lastly, uh, behavioral issues uh, were a topic that came up time and time again in our discussions, specifically the, the recognition that uh, engineering treatments could only go so far in preventing severe crashes within the region. But diving and drilling down even deeper, those of you who attended the uh, Safety Peer Exchange are familiar with the Wheel of Transportation Safety Planning. And again, this is really meant to represent a comprehensive view of safety planning at the regional level. So during the Peer Exchange, we had assessed our own individuals, agencies, current level of performance within each of these, these planning areas, with one being low and 10 being high. And as you recall, at the end of the event, we collectively shared how we had rated ourselves. And what you see on the screen um, are the average responses among participants from, from each of these areas. So for example, when looking at transportation safety data, uh, most of our agencies felt quite comfortable with the collection analysis of safety data. We felt we were able to utilize the data, tools, and resources provided by ODOT to identify safety issues within our regions effectively. Uh, related to transportation safety data is performance measures and targets. Generally, we felt we understood performance requirements, uh, with many organizations already starting to think about uh, setting targets, but we also recognize that further clarification and coordination would be would be useful. Uh, we also saw a need to better integrate safety into our long-range transportation plans through the development of explicit safety goals and objectives, with many agencies starting to do so. Uh, we also recognize there's likely opportunities to better ensure safety is considered within our uh, planning documents and effectively represented on our committees. And lastly, related to project planning, evaluation, and monitoring, we felt there were several current needs. And as I mentioned earlier, helping locals move from the planning realm into implementation was a major theme that was brought up throughout this event. And while I'll touch on this more heavily in a moment, this is really an area where there seems to be a lot of opportunity for growth moving forward. But at the end of the day, really the primary goal of the Peer Exchange was to establish uh, a baseline understanding across regional planning organizations and partners of uh, the current state of practice related to, to transportation safety planning. And moving forward, the goal is really to build upon that understanding and to turn our knowledge of shared challenges uh, and opportunities into actions and resources. 
And Safety Talk is a great example of this, right? Many organizations vocalize the need to have periodic webinars to hear what their peers are doing across the state and discover innovative life-saving practices. Another great example of this is the target setting workshop recently put on by FHWA in ODOT, helping answer some of the unanswered questions about federal safety performance measures and what regional coordination with the state should look like. Another example of this, which we're kicking off today, is a concentrated effort to understand how regional planning organizations can best provide assistance to local governments on safety initiatives, specifically working to streamline and pilot the use of three approaches that have been effective in addressing safety issues on the locally maintained system, providing safety assistance, coordinating road safety audits, and implementing regionally based systemic safety improvements. So while there is surely room for initiatives across a number of different fronts related to regional safety work, by initially focusing on providing direct assistance to local governments, we believe we'll be able to kill a lot of birds with the same stone. But an important question to ask is, is why focus on these three practices in particular? Well, first and foremost, collectively as a state, we have some shared experiences in each of these. Uh, one of the things the Pure Exchange showed is that some individual agencies um, or engaging in one, maybe two of these practices rather effectively. So we're not, we're not starting from scratch on these. And there, in fact, there's a lot of opportunity here to learn from one another as efforts, share best practices, and collectively develop some really great approaches. Second, all of these initiatives require close collaboration with locals, counties, state representatives to implement them, which is another important focus area that has been identified. So by working through each of these, we think we'll be able to strengthen those working relationships rather effectively. And third, and, and most importantly, these practices really cover much of the spectrum of safety issues that we find within our regions. So for example, you know, let's say we've identified a locally maintained intersection within our region that is showing a high frequency of severe angle crashes, and we know that a major intersection improvement will likely be needed to resolve it. You know, regional planning organizations may be able to take that next step, work with the DSRT and the local to begin development of a safety study at this location and ultimately utilizing both internal and external resources, uh, we'll be able to complete that study on the behalf of local and get it to the DSRT for funding consideration. Or let's say that we've been contacted by a local agency about a particular corridor where they're receiving significant uh, amount of complaints related to speeding and aggressive driving. Regional planning organizations may be able to play a key role in facilitating the formation of an RSA team made up of local engineers, safety professionals, and DSRT representatives to formally audit the corridor, document findings, and utilize the abbreviated safety study process, which Corey will talk about, to apply for funding assistance. Uh, or let's say that we've uh, noticed that not only there are a significant amount of pedestrian crashes occurring within our region, but they share common contributing factors, such as improper crossings or failure to yield. Regional planning organizations may be able to work with the DSRT to secure resources necessary to systematically implement low-cost countermeasures such as high visibility crosswalk markings or RFBs across a number of differently locally controlled systems within their region. So the point here is really to say that from uh, both low to high cost spot safety treatments to region-wide low cost systemic safety improvements, by providing this type of assistance to our local partners, regional planning organizations may be able to play a significant role in helping bridge the gap between issue identification uh, and project implementation. But the big question here is how. You know, how can we effectively share our individual experiences around each of these practices uh, with our peers across the state? How can we develop a solid understanding of the role of regional planning organizations and what they can reasonably play in the implementation of these practices if they choose to? How can we ensure that the resources are there to implement these processes and ultimately fund local projects? So really the first step in this process has been working to establish a transportation safety planning working group within OARC. So this, this group will ultimately be made up of interested MPOs and RTPOs, ODOT Central and District representatives and support staff to really serve as a core group to guide implementation of this focus effort. Um, initially this group will primarily be tasked with sharing ideas and testing assumptions and assisting in the documentation of current practice. Ultimately, this group will then serve as partners in piloting the implementation of these three strategies within their regions and, and bringing lessons learned back to the group for refinement. 
So to that end, we're beginning the process of looking for individuals and organizations interested in serving on this working group. And if you are interested in participating in this effort, there are several expectations going into it. And really, first and foremost, you should want to participate and really have an interest in actively and actually providing uh, additional assistance to local jurisdictions within your region. This, this effort is surely not a requirement. No one's ever going to force you to provide these services to locals, but we know that there are definitely agencies interested in this type of effort, and we want folks who are going to be engaged throughout the entire process. Uh, to that end, it's also important to not only attend meetings, but to come with a willingness to share. This is going to involve a lot of back and forth discussions and opportunities to talk about what your agency is doing on these fronts and the challenges that you've experienced along the way. In terms of immediate next steps, I will be sending out an email uh, to partners, uh, including people on this webinar, uh, uh, across the state, gauging interest in participating in this working group uh, and working to develop an official roster. Uh, you can then expect an initial kickoff meeting uh, to happen in no later than, than July, uh, where we'll further outline this effort and really start breaking down uh, all, all these different processes. So with that, I really thank you for your time today. Uh, know that I'm incredibly excited to start working with more of you much more intimately. Um, in your organizations, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have at the end of the, the webinar, but first I'm going to hand it over to Corey to talk about the abbreviated safety study process. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Corey. I think I know most of you at this point, but I work in ODOT safety program, and as has always been the goal in the safety program is to reduce and eliminate roadway fatalities and serious injuries on our roads and trails and make it safer for everyone. Uh, we do this through a number of approaches, but specifically I'm here today to talk, to talk about and brief our MPOs and our TPOs on the abbreviated Highway Safety Improvement Program application process. And that's probably the last time I'm going to say that entire <laughs> title. Because um, we're now looking to use this process to promote a few regionally significant safety projects within the year by extending this process to our planning organization. I'll start off by going over why we created the abbreviated process and why it's important to this group specifically, uh, followed by the importance of selecting prioritized locations and using lists that have been generated by ODOT as well as the planning organizations to uh, prioritize uh, different locations on Ohio's roads. Then I'll cover what makes a good project or what makes it eligible uh, for the abbreviated application beyond just being low cost. After that, I'll walk you through the application process as well as the website that the ODOT district staff will use to input these requests and then discuss um, how a project makes it through to funding. I'll wrap up this webinar by, webinar by covering some of the questions we received from, from during our uh, res, uh, registration for this webinar from you guys, as well as other questions you might have following this presentation. So the purpose of the abbreviated application process was to quickly move safety improvements that don't necessarily, necessarily require the full-on biannual safety review. This process allows for a less expensive, less complex project to get through the safety review process and receive funding faster. While we have had success working with the district safety staff uh, thus far, finding good locations and good projects, we are now looking to add focus on the local component. And so we are looking to use this time over the next year as kind of a trial period to fine tune the application, um, the application process before we consider offering this up to any local governments. So to be clear, for the time being, only RTPOs, MPOs, and ODOT staff will be able to recommend projects for this abbreviated process. And just within the first year of this new process, um, it's proven to be very effective. It doesn't simply just organize our off-cycle requests or just prioritize the review of those requests. Um, this process has managed to approve, uh, get $2.5 million approved for 23 different safety projects across eight ODOT districts and 15 different counties. So this has really allowed us to not only get projects out faster, but has also led to a geographically diverse and hopefully thorough layout of projects in Ohio. And I think we all know fatalities and serious injuries are continuing to rise. Based on the comments uh, that this group has provided both in the uh, peer exchange as well as setting targets for our SHSP um, uh, goals, it doesn't appear that any of us believe that these trends are just magically going to reverse themselves. Um, but, but it's really about looking at those factors that we can control. We do know things like lower gas prices and increased travel are working against us, but we have to continue our efforts and target locations and crashes where we stand to get the highest return on our investment. 
This includes locations from ranked lists and those that are backed by data, and of course, our locally owned roads. In Ohio, we have 121,000 miles of road, and only 19,000 of that is maintained by ODOT. That's only 16%. So when you consider that 84% of our network is made up of local routes, it's really not that surprising that the majority of our crashes, uh, fatalities, and serious injuries occur along these roadways. And when looking at our strategic highway safety plan emphasis areas, other than the expected areas of maybe work zone and commercial motor vehicle, the majority of our serious injuries and fatalities that fall within these emphasis areas occur on local roads as opposed to state roads. And for these types of reasons, as well as the comments Jordan mentioned from the peer exchange, um, our safety program is really pushing for a much larger focus on these local roads. And included in that effort is an opportunity to find and fund more local roads projects throughout our abbreviated safety application. Um, and perhaps the biggest benefit of using the abbreviated process and using um, the HSIP applications that we're offering a much wider range of improvements instead of just signage or systematic fixes as we have in the past. Plus, we're able to target spot treatments and kind of get that those low hanging fruit or those uh, larger bang for your buck projects. So priority list. With this expansion of the process, to RTPOs and MPOs, we really want to utilize the priority list that already exists out there. Uh, planning organizations should bring forward their best candidates as not to overload this system with um, a lot of new random funding needs. The projects brought through the abbreviated system should be regionally significant, as Jordan mentioned, and fall on one of these following types of priority lists. The MPO and RTPO priority lists. Um, lists that are ranked by crash, uh, high crash locations. These are a great place to find those regionally ranked locations that I was referring to and perform uh, regional significant, regionally significant projects. Uh, the safety integrated project maps. Any of you who listened in on our webinar for the L&D manual crash analysis section knows that this is one of our original and uh, most useful avenues for finding abbreviated uh, safety projects. Uh, for those of you who haven't looked at the SIP maps that much, these are developed using HSM methodology. Um, they're looking at places where we have excess crashes. The blue locations on these maps are places where we have potential to reduce three to five crashes per year. And the red locations are places where we have um, an opportunity to reduce five or more crashes per year. Um, the major difference being with these um, locations is that in the past, red locations have been the ones that have been brought to the safety committee, and now we're kind of opening up all ranked locations as places we want people to look at. Um, along with the SIPMAPs are the safety analyst uh, HSIP priority list. Uh, these kind of go hand in hand, but these are the different lists between the different roadways in Ohio that will also have, um, we have maps, we have lists provided on our website of these locations that are great places to bring for an abbreviated safety application. And then, of course, the county road high crash location maps and lists, um, because this is an effort for us to try and focus treatments more on local roads, this is also a great resource for you to use when looking for that location. Project eligibility. Again, the abbreviated process offers us a much wider range of improvements based on engineering decisions. But what, what makes a location or project eligible to apply for abbreviated safety funding? And really, uh, overall time, the overall goal here is to find non-complex projects, so projects that have a short timeline, ones that are nearly ready for construction, and we're hoping to put this money into construction. We're not really looking to fund right-of-way or design with this pot of money. Um, we also want proven countermeasures. Hopefully, uh, you're able to find countermeasures that are not only, that are either on FHWA's uh, proven, proven countermeasure list or a countermeasure that's been previously used in Ohio that an ODOT DSRT would approve of. Um, we're not looking to do pilot or experimental projects at this time through the abbreviated process. Um, and of course, the, the major factor is the project being under $500,000. Um, we have not set a minimum threshold of um, how, how little you can ask for, but we are discouraging locals from bringing a smaller request that uh, could and should be handled within their own budget. Beyond, beyond that, these projects should be tied to those priori prioritized lists I mentioned before and have ODOT district coordination and backing alongside them because in the end, your district coordinator is going to be the one who will be inputting this application into the system. 
And I just wanted to provide one example of, uh, of a project I found that we funded this year um, of what a great abbreviated HSIP application would look like. Um, this one was to request an upgrade for a signal uh, so that other improvements could be made to the signal as the span wire was not capable of holding uh, what they wanted, which were back plates in this situation, in this case. Um, within their project description, they provided things, important things like the ranking, uh, number 56 on our urban intersections list, and that's from that safety analyst priority list that I showed you earlier. Um, and they made the case through crash data. So you can see down below, they had 72 intersection crashes over three years. Um, and they had that broken out in their crash summary, very, very simple, very easy to understand. And at such a low cost, at $175,000, they, it wasn't a hard sell for them to tell us that by inputting back plates, making the signal more visible, um, we were going to have a benefit of well over $175,000 um, when addressing the types of crashes they showed. And then the application process. So now into the fun part. Corey, please show us where we can get the money. And so first and foremost, again, oh, I got knocked out of presentation. Sorry about that. Um, first and foremost, again, consult with your DSRTs and your district safety review team um, to make sure that your the prioritized location that you've chosen and maybe the countermeasures you picked out to address the crash pattern uh, makes sense to them as well and that, that they support this decision. Um, and then also help provide them the necessary information for them to one, fill out the funding application, and two, really support and show the benefit of this project. And so application components, here's what you're going to need to provide to your district coordinators um, beyond just the location and the countermeasure you've selected. Uh, if you do not provide your coordinator all this information, it may make it a little hard for them to make a compelling application for uh, this, these safety dollars. Uh, important things to remember from this list especially are things like cost. It's difficult to weigh the benefit of the project if we don't know how much it's going to cost. It's also difficult to approve funding when we don't know how much we're approving. Also, from the pro project description, be sure to provide the details as to why this location is a priority, what list or map is it on. Um, also include the countermeasure that you have chosen and why. Uh, while you may reference a study or the crash history or collision diagram, the project description itself is really a great place to summarize that instead of providing uh, really, really in-depth details and give a clear picture of how your conclusion was drawn. Uh, please also include maybe what other countermeasures you had attempted prior um, before reaching this alternative. And then if previous crash analysis, analysis exists or HSM analysis, or maybe you've gone deeper through a safety study, um, that's great information to share. So we provide room for attachments um, at the bottom of the application. Those are great things to show, but we do not expect you to perform an ECAT or HSM analysis to apply for these funds. And so I'm going to try and open up the funding application just to run our uh, district coordinators who may not be overly familiar with it um, real quick. And just to show so you expect so that our MPOs and our TPOs will understand what they expect to uh, need to provide to them. Corey, this is Victoria. As a quick reminder, you're sharing the um, PowerPoint application right now, so you may need to I'm switch to I'm going to see if sharing. I can even bring up the website. My connection's pretty yeah. rough right now, so we might just have to talk about the screenshot of it, which everything's on the screenshot, but... Okay. Well, you just may need to switch over to sharing the other app. Okay. Yep. While Corey's doing that, I would encourage you, if you have questions that you have um, been thinking of, to go ahead and start putting those in the chat pod. So when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, you'll be um, have some questions already in there for our presenters. Is it showing the website now, Victoria? Sure is. Awesome. Bring it up here so you guys can see. All right, so the abbreviated application process is on the same page as our biannual review process. And so when a district would like to put in an application, they just come over to this corner and click on here to submit abbreviated safety application.
Victoria, will it stay with this page if I go to the next URL? Yes, it should. Right now we're seeing you click on the click here. And the wheel's spinning. There we go. It's loading up now. So are you seeing abbreviated safety funding applications? We sure are. All right, awesome. So you'll notice on here there's location or uh, there's links to find the the SIP maps and see what other projects have been input. Um, you can see what projects you input if you need to figure out what your abbreviated app ID is going to be. Um, you just want to pick the next number in succession, um, unless of course you have your PID. But here's where you click to get your new application. I'm thinking that jump. Corey, it looks like you've opened another page up. Yes. I'm going, can I, I just need to switch over to that one, right? Yeah, it's showing white for us right now. It's showing white for me too. Perfect. Okay. Okay. That is what I want. And it will hopefully bring this application. So first and foremost, as this is coming up, if it will, um, Very slowly. But first and foremost, what you're going to need to provide to your district is just the general location information. Um, the more specific, the better, just for us. Um, when they input it, it's kind of optional field. So if they're able to put in a more specific location, I'm starting to think this is not going to come up. Go back to the PowerPoint so you guys have something to look at. There we go. Okay. Now we are not seeing the PowerPoint on our screen. You guys are seeing the abbreviated safety funding application though? We're still seeing the blank white screen that we saw before. So you might have to switch over to sharing the PowerPoint application again. We'll come back to the PowerPoint thing because it's got essentially the same thing showing. Okay. Okay, so on this screenshot, it's got almost everything. Uh, you'll notice the location information at the top, um, mostly for district, when the district go to input this. The more specific you can be on your location, the better to help the reviewer find the location quicker. Again, we want to get through these. We have a lot of requests coming in, so we want to get through these as fast as possible. Um, cost estimate, construction funding year, um, things you would expect to see. And then the description of the project. Um, that area is not necessarily a place we need to write a novel or put an entire safety study. So please provide highlights and explain exactly what this project is and why you've chosen the fix that you have or the countermeasure that you have. Um, remember, you can always attach multiple files down at the bottom. You can't see here there's a place to put attachments, but you can put as many as you need of studies, collision diagrams, maybe HSM analysis. And then in the crash summary section, um, this is really the why section. So this is a summary that should explain what is being addressed by your project. Show us the crash pattern, show us the crash history, um, and then also, um, if nothing else, as far as attachments, please provide a, a CAM tool layout of the crashes that you have. Um, and then also at the very bottom of this, there's a checkbox, and that is just for the DSRT to check and have this application in Central Central Office for review. Very last thing I'm going to go over are the questions that you provided. Um, and then if you have any afterwards, just type them into the chat pod. Um, first off, are there any requirements to monitor crashes after the countermeasures have been implemented? And that is a no currently. You are not required to monitor crashes after these countermeasures have been uh, implemented. Uh, Michelle is working to hire someone out to look at all of our HSIP projects and do a before and after analysis, um, which will also include these abbreviated HSIP projects. Next question, can we provide a formatted Excel file that local jurisdictions or uh, the planning organizations can complete and then send to the district, or can we just provide access for them to enter their own information into the application? We did discuss providing access out beyond the district safety staff, but 
That would likely add some steps to the process or interfere with the importance of the coordination between the planning organizations and the ODOT staff um, for those who wish to apply. Uh, we can definitely provide an Excel file that would pretty much follow the same format of the form I just showed uh, as a tool for jurisdictions, MPOs, RTPOs to fill out and then provide to ODOT staff for them to input uh, quickly and easily. Can a project still be approved without falling on one of these priority lists? The short answer is yes. The long answer is how, however, yes. However, the goal here is to keep the system from being flooded um, with every random request people can think of in the local jurisdictions. Uh, so it takes time to review each of these individual requests, so we don't want to overload the system. Um, so we want to keep this a quick process by relying highly and heavily on those prioritized projects and those prioritized locations. Uh, we do understand there are limits to our data on local roads, so we know that not necessarily having a perfect graph on local AD, ADT and those other factors may, may jar our list a little bit one way or the other. So you may find a location that's performing worse than its peer sites, um, and those may come through, but for the most part we'd like you to focus on the prioritized list as they are. And then a very important question, why can't you just give all your safety money to District 12? I will allow all of you to answer that in the chat pod. <laughs> and I, because I think showing two District 12 counties in one PowerPoint presentation is enough, Brian. Um, and then if there are any other questions, Michelle's dog would be really curious to hear them. She would be. <laughs> and, and actually, there's already a question in the chat pod. Um, it, it comes from Matt Hill, and, and he wants to know, since these are low cost, projects, can they be applied for any time or only during the April-October DSRT time frame? Anytime. That's the whole purpose That's the of purpose. this process. That if you've got a simple, non-complex, non same thing, uh, project that is under $500,000 and it's on one of these priority lists, then we would like to see it out of cycle. We want to try and move these to uh, implementation as quickly as possible instead of waiting twice a year with all the other complex, bigger jobs. Great. We have another question in the chat pod. Who will administer local projects if the MPO has requested funding? The question, and then the local agency? Uh, probably. Probably that's the expectation, especially if it's a simple job, but I could envision, you know, I guess that's a discussion that we would have to have on a project by project basis. But theoretically, these should be simple enough that it shouldn't require us to administer them. Are we allowed to and open up the uh, phone lines here, Victoria? Absolutely. There's one discussion. more. I'm going to open the phone lines up as we speak, but there is one more question. They okay. wanted to know, is it 80-20 on the funding split? And I'm unmuting everybody down the line, so feel free to jump in and start asking questions or telling District 12 why all the safety money can't go up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the typical match is 90-10. So it's just like any other safety project. We require a 10% match unless it's fine signals, pavement markings, and, and guardrail. Those are 100% eligible. So other questions? Nope. Corey, you, did, you guys did such a great job. It's so well, clear. One more oh, question more? in the chat okay. pod. Okay. Do you have a list of those 23 or so projects that have been funded? Yes. And we, do we want to provide that publicly? Uh, sure. Or I just send out an email to, who's that? We'll send out a group. <laughs> we'll send out an that email. That question to from Carrie. Sure. We'll provide a list of those projects. Yeah, it might be a good, uh, yeah, that would be a good summary, I guess, of the types of projects that, that we've approved so far. That makes sense. Happy to do it. Any other questions? Yeah, Michelle, this is Chris Farcola from uh, District 11. I, I know you, uh, you, you want the monies to go towards construction, but, you know, when these locals come with these, uh, you know, non-complex projects, it, there's got to be some kind of documentation either some kind of design plans or something and you know you know really they don't have the money to I, I guess uh, you know fund that portion you know for the for the design you know even if it's a 
you know, a signal upgrade, there's got to be some kind of, um, you know, design component to it. I, I guess with this application process, would would listing the, I guess, proposed, uh, I guess, design fee, uh, you know, along with that application, should that be all part of that? Or do, do you have to look at some other funding sources for the design portion uh, of these jobs? Uh no, I mean, we'll, we'll consider it, Chris, which is why we said we, we're going to rely heavily on uh, projects that are near ready for construction and don't have a lot of that excess baggage of needing significant design or right-of-way. Um, but we haven't precluded anyone. I, I believe if we look at the abbreviated application, there is a box where you could put in for, I think, right-of-way and design. Um, but we can consider it on a case-by-case -case basis. I would just include it in the entire project cost. I think we have construction costs as a label of the box. But you can go ahead and put the entire project cost there and maybe provide um, a cost breakdown in, in the attachment like you would with the Or in the, the description, other. I guess. Yeah. yeah. And I, I guess what you, when, you, when you're talking about, you know, projects ready, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that they already have some some kind of plan already developed and they just need the funding to construct or? Yep, it could be that or it's so simple that it's not going to require much design work at all. Okay. But again, if you have other projects that you believe are quick hits and requires a little bit of design but a local government is flat broke, um, we would certainly consider funding it. Um, but really, the abbreviated is trying to focus on those things that are ready to roll. Yep. Okay. Oh, a very important question came out of the chat pod. They want to know whose dog that was on the last slide of the PowerPoint. What did you say? I'm sorry, Victoria? That they want to know whose dog that was on the last slide of the PowerPoint. Uh, that is my husky, Sassy. Uh, she is four years old. I adopted her last year, and she is awesome. She's my best friend. So I'll put her on this slide, because who doesn't like dogs? <laughs> and if you don't like dogs, don't tell me. Because I'll just be <laughs> mad. Um, so uh, the last thing I will tell you today, uh, other than I really appreciate everybody joining us today, uh, is that, again, the goal of Safety Talk is to have these semi-informal discussions among safety professionals, uh, once a quarter. So after this webinar today, if you have some ideas on what could be featured on Safety Talk, or maybe you're doing something in your uh, region of the state that you want to tout related to safety, uh, please send an email to Corey or I, and we will uh, try and schedule you as a part of this process. So with that, again, we appreciate everybody's time, and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your help, Victoria. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.